good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to moderate the green finance session of the Donna Green the Building Summit for 2021. Uh, I have some great guests here, uh, people who I've admired in the industry, and I really love the opportunity uh, for them to introduce themselves. Uh, I have Ben, Nanayao, Sheikh, and Anel. Uh, and so for those who are online, I'll be grateful if you could uh, introduce yourself, starting with Anel. Oops. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We're scattered all over the world. It's an absolute honor and pleasure to be joining the fourth iteration of the Ghana Green Building Summit uh, all the way from Colorado. But uh, as it was last year, this is another event that seems to move the industry forward. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Eric, my name is Anele Makwaza, for those who are not familiar. I'm the founder and CEO of Ikuku Global. And Ikuku Global is a technology company making it incredibly easy to search, structure, and trade sustainable assets. And um, really happy to be here because there's absolutely nothing more urgent than accelerating the flow of capital to the trillion dollar opportunity of building retrofitting and financing a sustainable future. Sure, thank you very much for that. Jake? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Shaq Salankwa. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. I'm very glad that uh, such events exist to, to further the cause. I'm managing partner of HC Capital Properties. We're a real estate investment and development firm. Um, we focus mostly on uh, commercial and uh, residential real estate. Um, we have Cote d'Ivoire, as uh, and Francophone Africa as the primary market and Nigeria Ghana as our secondary uh, market. So pleasure to be here and uh, share our experience in the green space. A pleasure meeting you. And uh, I guess in the studio, we have uh, Nanayao and Ben. So Nanayao, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure, thanks. Um, my name is Nanayao Pache. I work as an investment director for Danish investment fund, IFU. I am part of the Africa team and the constantly sourcing and structuring and then execution investments uh, across the region. We, we manage close to $1.6 billion in assets and we invest not just in the green space, but also in different uh, developing areas uh, across developing countries. Hi, and please go ahead, uh, Ben. Yes, uh, Benjamin Jeppe Garber, Managing Director with uh, City LLC. We are a transaction advisory uh, practice, um, provide a range of advisory services um, and structuring services. We have most recently been focusing heavily on um, sustainable finance. And um, I think one of the things we're most really proud of is uh, working with the World Economic Forum as a contributor to the recently launched uh, country financing roadmap uh, for Ghana. No, thank you very much. Uh, but just for the benefit of those online, as I said, my name is Eric uh, Appiah from Blackstar Group, uh, an investment bank uh, in Ghana focused on the DCM, ECM capital markets uh, in the country. And we've worked on quite a few bond issuances. So this is pretty exciting for me to be able to learn some of the newer things that are happening in the industry at this time. We have a great panel here. Uh, so for Anel and for Sheik, I, I be, I've been reading about some of the work that you've been doing, and I'll be grateful in starting with Anel, if you can tell us a bit about how you're looking at green finance in the context of your company and, and, and how you manage that, that would be great. And then I can go to Sheik and then to the members uh, within the studio. So please fire away. Yeah, thank you. That's a sensational question, uh, Eric. So um, I come at uh, the, the green finance environment from a traditional banking background. I was at Barclays for, for 10 years, and that's how I initially left South Africa and flew on the wings of the Blue Eagle and lived in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania for two years, in Accra for two years. And it was really while I was treasurer of the bank in the Seychelles um, that the green finance movement crystallized. Um, the Nature Conservancy walked into my office one day and begun to lay out what would become um, the world's first blue bond in the Seychelles to protect an area of the ocean the size of France. And having lived in many markets, some frontier, some emerging and, and some more mature, um, I, I sat there just absolutely in awe, recognizing the opportunity for all of us on the continent and all the markets we've lived in. But at the same time, I thought, you know, we've recapitalized banks um, in Ghana at, at the time, Franklin Templeton had just 
sort of finished uh, the big government of Ghana Bund, which was the biggest uh, in, in sub-Saharan African history at the time. And I thought, we know a lot about risk, but we really don't know how to look at a portfolio through a sustainability lens or a climate lens. And at the same time, I recognize the language of finance changing. And I thought that if we don't bring a capability to project developers on a continent where 80% of projects don't even reach financial close, um, we risk as an entire continent being left out of this transition. So that was sufficient enough for me uh, to um, leave banking and begin to think about what is this capability that we need to put in place to accelerate the flow of capital to, to emerging markets. At the same time, I was bothered by the fact that globally, you hear things like $4 trillion in negative yielding bonds in Japan alone. So it really struck me that, you know, there's no shortage of money, but somehow there are worthy projects on the continent that don't get the, the finance that they deserve. And so we set out to answer these questions, speaking to investors in, in the global north, uh, in Europe and, and the US, around what is the blockage to flows of capital, uh, already understanding that project developers have this burden of, number one, bringing their projects to market in a bankable fashion, and now facing this potential additional risk of having to organize their data to meet sustainability mandates and tap into green finance. And what we found really speaking to the likes of the New York Pension Fund, who have a $3 billion mandate for Africa and not $1 allocated, was that they felt they didn't really understand the continent very well. And they certainly didn't understand the climate related investment opportunity. And then the second challenge and feedback that we got from engaging investors was this one around check sizes and aggregation. And that's really how the Ikuku Global Solution started to put, pull itself together. And uh, what we began building is what we call a first of kind climate adaptation and access to market platform that really allows project developers to manage their sustainability data and then tap into this green finance registry that we've built across the spectrum of finance from development finance institutions to banks and private equity. Because really the only difference between vanilla finance and green finance is this condition around being able to maintain transparency around the underlying use of proceeds and demonstrating that that is going for, towards an environmentally beneficial cause. So we definitely felt that that was a digital capability that needed to happen. And really that by putting that in place, we can catalyze a carbon transition because Africa is the highest point of leverage when we think of our climate future. Oh, no, so that, that was briefly how, how sort of the thinking behind how we started. And in terms of where we started, the, the only place that seemed right for us to start was Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, Access Bank was bringing to market uh, the, the Echo Atlantic uh, first commercial green bond on the continent at the time. And the curiosity in Nigeria, the appetite for green finance and the need in terms of developers coming to market was just robust and, and that's where we got the most engagement. Sure, no, thank you very much. Uh, and I mean, that's, that's an amazing story. And, you know, it's one that sort of repeats itself in, even, in, even in Ghana now in terms of access to, to that finance. So it's great to hear that you're building a platform uh, and I'm sure that we will do uh, more with you as, as we go along. Uh, Sheikh, I know you've done some really interesting things on your side, on the development side. So it'll be great to hear about you and your examples of green finance and how that has panned out. Yeah, th thanks for that. Um, well, so our journey is actually interesting as how as to how we landed in the, the green finance space. Um, you know, we're a traditional um, investment management and, and development uh, company. And so, you know, we started a shopping center project in, in Abidjan. Um, you know, for those that are in Accra, think of you know, developing Accra Mall, uh, basically. So we're developing something that, you know, is a similar size and uh, to a Cromo. And as we did it, we knew we wanted the, the building to be uh, certified by one of the international uh, frameworks. Uh, so there's a number of them, there's LEED, there's BREEN, there's EDGE. Um, and in the end, we kind of didn't really have time to do that in the foray of the, the development. Uh, but the team was really focused on, on designing building that was uh, uh, sustainable uh, and that had all the different uh, elements to make sure that it was an optimized building 
from both a capex and an and opex perspective. So the operational costs would be managed. So that's what we did. And after we opened the shopping center in, in 2018, we went back and decided to go with the edge certification. And so we you know, did the certification um, after we opened. So you know, it was a long process for them to go and audit and, and see what we did. And it turned out that we actually uh, designed um, you know, a phenomenal building from that perspective that exceeded um, you know, a lot of the threshold that, that, that were set you know, around uh, materials use, uh, energy uh, efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. Threshold is typically around 20%. Um, you know, we're exceeding it between 30 and, and 45%. Um, so, so that was great um, being able to get that afterwards and really validated a little bit of kind of our thesis from the beginning, which is, you know, you can try to um, make sure you get your returns. Uh, and at the same time, you can make sure that whatever you're doing is, is climate friendly um, and, and, and efficient. Uh, and for us, this was like the direct proof of the pudding. And so on, on the back of that, um, we, we thought that it was a, a good time to try to access the, um, the green financing uh, 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 space because we always had the view that over time, uh, we would be raising uh, green financing to kind of um, sustain our, uh, to fund our projects. And so we decided to do it this time around um, by refinancing because it was a little bit easier for people to digest. Um, then trying to to raise a bond for a project on a greenfield uh, basis. So, you know, we looked at um, different options, which was, you know, uh, going directly with specific institution or doing a private placement bond uh, and doing a regular bond. And we decided to do a private placement bond in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, and, you know, private placement bonds are basically bonds. Uh, the only difference is that, you know, you can only sell them to um, investors that, um, uh, to institutional investors basically, and, uh, and that they're not traded on the, on the stock exchange, but the process is the same. So we had to get a rating uh, by one of the local rating agency that's called Bloomfield. We need to get uh, a visa from the, the, the regulator, uh, the CREPMF, which is the, uh, the financial sector's uh, regulator. And we also needed to get the different acquisition so that our bond can be labeled green. And you know, we did this in two steps. Uh, typically people go to this specialized consultants that can basically uh, approve your, your framework and how you're gonna report your user funds, et cetera. So we did that with the NLV, uh, but we also went a step further by also getting uh, the, the wrap from the Climate Bond Initiative, which is basically the highest wrapping you can, you can get for um, a green bond that you're issuing uh, globally. Uh, and we did that. So you know, if you look at um, all of the steps, basically you know, tick the box on, 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 on all the standards uh, from a global perspective. Um, so if we're issuing a green bond um, in Denmark, then, you know, it's more or less what we would be uh, would be doing, uh, so it's on the back of that that we then went to the the market um, to market our bond. Obviously, uh, since it's a regulated thing, you need to have a, a, a regulated uh, arranger and broker, which is a local firm in Abidjan, um, that did that, and we approached a, a number of investors uh, in the region, uh, and it was you know very well welcomed, and we were actually thirty percent over oversubscribed on the issuance, so we weren't even able to, to satisfy the, 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 the demand, uh, but that's you know, a good place to be, right? Because now uh, we know that there's appetite and, and there's a number of things now that we're thinking about doing in the future, where we know we'll be coming back um, you know, to, to the market to get uh, you know, green financing. And really along these lines, basically at some point, you know, we're most likely gonna um, take the, the zero carbon pledge so that you know all of our developments basically um, you know will have a target to go towards zero carbon obviously uh, this is a big commitment so we're kind of working through now uh, our ability to, to to sustain and respect that across the different things that we're doing because we're doing residential 
Um, you know, we, we're looking at stuff in hospitality as well, on top of commercial, so with the shopping center and office. So we're kind of trying to work that through. See, by next year, we'll be able to do that, which will allow us basically for all of our platform to consistently uh, go after uh, green financing. Sure. Look, th this is a fascinating story, and I'm sure a lot of people who are online who are watching this are particularly interested in your story. Um, and so, you know, you've spoken around the various sort of hurdles you had to jump regulatory wise, investment advisors, et cetera. Um, in terms of the cost of the, the green finance, does the, did the extra advice you needed negate essentially the cost of the funding that you were essentially getting in that, you know, even though typically green finance is not necessarily cheaper than your regular con uh, commercial finance, uh, sometimes it can be a little bit concessional. But was that sort of eroded by the fact that you had to go through several advisors and, and go through, you know, ratings agencies, uh, you know, some kind of independent entity to, to look at the bond and, and give it all the, the, the accreditation it needed? Uh, what, was it, what was it in your case? Uh, so that's a good question. But there's a couple of different elements. Um, if you take out the green out of it, there is the kind of private placement route and then there is a traditional banking route. Um, so there's a bit more friction if you go and issue uh, a bond, obviously, uh, because you need a rating and all of these things. Uh, if you do bank debt, bank debt would have been the easy way out. You could have gotten relatively comparable, in some ways, uh, levels of, 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 of financing. But, you know, this is, for us, this is, that would be narrow-minded, right? Because we're looking five steps ahead. And the view is with the green financing, you can start to attract investors that you wouldn't be uh, traditionally be able to attract. So investors regionally and in, in, in other places. Um, so from the cost perspective, that's the first <laughs> bet that you, you, you have to go through. And obviously uh, you can get access to more capital if you go to the markets and if you go to the banking sector. And the banking obviously um, is a more constrained, has a lot more constraints around how, you know, you lended money uh, compared to, to, to a bond. So from that perspective, a tiny bit more of friction. Now, the bond, we could have done a bond without making the green bond. You know, we're, we're still trying to figure out, you know, to be honest, whether you're getting that premium for the green insurance you know, you, you can't really make that uh, a state. There's not enough data for us to be able to make that statement because you don't have enough comps, uh, comparables, right? People that have issued regular bonds versus green bonds with you know, similar tenure, uh, similar type of businesses. So it's very hard to, to make that statement. Um, so could we have gotten a comparable um, um, rate? Probably. Um, maybe slightly better on the margin, uh, but that's not really the deciding uh, factor in the end. I think the fact that you're able to still remain um, competitive and have the agenda of, of, of being green, I think is where there's a lot of value and where I think you're going to start to see a migration from a lot of institutions that will start to say that they only uh, invest in such product but for that to happen you need to have more of such product available in the in the market so i think that's where by the time you start to get uh, a bit more volume and i think what you're going to see is everything has being equal people going towards these uh, sustainable financing options over regular financing options sure so just two more questions before i go to nanayao and, and ben and so in terms of i mean i think for most people within the real estate industry the most people have accused the real estate industry of dollarizing most African economies because rents, building construction costs are all based in dollars. So um, the finance generally comes in USD. But what portion of, let's say, for your bond was subscribed locally uh, by, by, by investors? And how much interest did you see from uh, not only, let's say, the, the international organizations, but other, across other West African countries, whether there was any particular uh, interest in it? And then the, the second one is, in terms of managing that FX risk, how do you do it within your, your real estate portfolio? Hopefully we can get two quick answers to that and then I can just go over to uh, Nanayao and to Ben. 
yeah apologies for the for the long answers okay. uh, 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 i'll make you a bit jealous on from that perspective cote d'ivoire i think doesn't have the same issues as as you know ghana and nigeria <laughs> just because, you know, the the cfa is back to the euro and basically people um equate the cfa to euro so you know we don't really deal with with currency risk in this in the same way our leases are in local currency and the debt we issue has been, are in local currency. So the bond is 100% local currency. It's 7.5%. We're in a low inflationary environment, 2 to 3% uh, inflation. So uh, that's the one advantage with this region where you don't have to deal with that. I think in the Ghanaian and, and, and Nigerian and Kenyan context, it's, it's a bit different. Well, it's very different because you have the mismatch between your you know, dollar leases uh, that really are local currency leases because I mean, we've seen it during the crisis. You sign a, a lease in, in dollars and then the currency goes down 25%, you, you're going to renegotiate your lease. I mean, there's no other way it's going to happen. So it was a, a virtual dollarization. Um, and then, you know, you have the debt in, in, in dollars. So I think the issues that you have to deal with um, from a Ghanaian perspective, uh, this is one point that's going to be a lot more complex to 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 deal with, and and you know in the long term there's really the fundamental question as to whether you know, the leases are really going to r- remain in in dollars or whether you know as you've seen in some areas indexed to to dollars but in local currency and how you play around with that and maybe the trickle down to when you issue a local bond uh, your ability to to do that. Yeah. No. Thank you. I- thank. You. No. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, if I may just jump in on that one, Eric. I think we'd be amiss to not recognize that, you know, the whole carbon transition and the green finance opportunity is also one that uh, is an opportunity for Anglophone Africa to mobilize domestic markets in a way that they haven't been before. Um, Yes, there's the dollar factor, but we look at Nigeria, for instance, uh, that went from never having issued a green bond to now being called almost a serial issuer, the first commercial green bond with Access Bank. There is a unique opportunity there, and Sheikh also has experienced it in his oversubscribed bonds in Francophone and in Côte d'Ivoire to engage the communities that we're building to make more resilient, particularly because there is a shortage of assets, right? The capital markets of Nigeria are, are, are less than sort of 10%, the total market value is less than 10% of GDP, Whereas you look at a market like South Africa, where the JSE volumes are sort of 300% of GDP. So there's a fantastic opportunity to buy developers coming to markets to raise from the local Mm -hmm. market, create new assets uh, for people to invest in while uh, transitioning their economies as well, uh, which is one that I think all banks and and developers should be focused on. Sure, no, thanks for that. And so Nana, at IFU, how are you guys? Yeah. I mean, for us at IFU, we, we approach green finance in two ways. Um, we do um, green project bonds, essentially just taking um, underlying project risk that have, uh, that have, that have strong green elements. Um, we like, of course, if the projects have uh, internationally uh, acclaimed certifications like EDGE certification, it helps. And, 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 and that's one way we, we, we do it. And then secondly, we, we try to do it indirectly by giving funding to banks so they can all lend to businesses that naturally we will not be able to do directly because of size and, and, and some other dynamics. So that's, that's the way uh, naturally we, we approach green financing. I mean, um, last year we did uh, a deal in Nigeria in a company called Daystar together with us, uh, Popaco uh, Store Infrastructure and Morgan Stanley Climate Fund. That's around $38 million in, in financing. And that's essentially a, a distributed solar transaction where you're going to have solar for industrials and corporates across West Africa. So that's one of that. And then on Monday, I'm actually um, signing another transaction in South Africa. That's a student accommodation transaction that is edge certified. Um, and then of course, uh, we are doing that together with IFC and a couple of other investors as well. So that's for us, when we look at the transaction, I think it's not, of course, we want the transactions to be green, but then we need to be convinced that the projects make sense. And it's one that we'd, we'd like to invest in. And that's, 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 that's one way we, we invest in it. 
Aside that, we will look at banks who are strong green elements and are willing to, 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 to come with us and then abide by the, the different rules and sustainability rules that we put forward. And then we give them financing so that they can also go out and, and give financing to, to local businesses that we, we naturally will not be able to finance. Are, are there particular sectors that you wouldn't touch at all? Yes, I mean, as, as a DFI, as a development finance institution, there are sectors that, that we wouldn't do. Um, I mean, naturally, we're not allowed to do um, sectors that have no real development impacts. Um, so, I mean, I think classic examples are gambling and then weapons and a couple of other areas that naturally uh, you wouldn't find DFI financing. However, I mean, for every DFI, there are sectors or areas that you are most comfortable with. And then you have a lot of experience in them believing that you'll be able to get a development impact that we do for properties. We don't necessarily invest in commercial properties. Um, we don't have anything against commercial uh, projects. It's just that for us, we think we don't, the development impacts around commercial building, it's not strong enough for us. I mean, we will rather do a student accommodation transaction because we think that the impacts for the fact that the students can actually get uh, good accommodation for, for learning is, 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 is good for us. And that's what, that's what I would like to support. So it depends on the transaction, uh, who's behind it, and also size also matters for us. Yeah. Sure, great. And Ben? Yes. You know. Well, our journey, well, our journey began um, in terms of transition to focusing on uh, climate and sustainable finance actually back in 2012 when we were mandated to act as a transaction advisor with um, working with the DBSA in introducing the project bond. The, the experience with advising the, the experience advising the DBSA and uh, working with the JSC in introducing project bonds um, to, as a means to, and as an innovative way to finance the gas to power program and a number of renewable energy projects. And, um, and so we began building a team um, that could basically provide uh, end-to-end -end, uh, solutions in terms of uh, designing green bond, uh, frame, uh, the green bond frameworks for respective clients. We've done that by bringing on partners such as Green Square Ventures um, to assist us. And we can also act as a uh, sustainability manager, which is obviously key. Um, so in terms of uh, that particular experience too, it's allowed us to work closely as one of the contributors to the country financing roadmap um, for Ghana, Ghana being the first to actually bring one of these to market. I find it, that all said, I find it a bit fortuitous that we're speaking today, uh, a day when uh, Bloomberg has announced that the green bond market is now a $1.2 trillion market as of yesterday. Something just started from 3 billion 10 years ago. <laughs> 3 billion um, about 10 years ago. And in terms of how green bonds can be utilized, I find it interesting that, you know, raised the point about, you know, a lot of projects not being able to access funding because most of it is in hard currency. Ghana, I think, is doing a great job in uh, bringing about the green bonds framework with the SEC and also the uh, NPRA providing certain incentives to um, pension funds to, um, as far as allocation of pro, uh, their funding to support green bond initiatives. Uh, these initiatives are key because obviously now allows some of the smaller transactions uh, that require local currency to be able to access that. So all these points I think are quite significant. And obviously the final point I wanna highlight is that um, having worked on issues around SDGs, um, need to impress upon the fact that um, climate, um, climate change is quite real and that 40% of CO2 emissions are actually generated from buildings. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's significant that we keep that point in mind and green bonds, sustainable bonds present a significant way to finance green buildings and related infrastructure to really make a significant dent in that reduction of, um, of uh, CO2 emissions that comes from the uh, building and real estate sector. Sure. No, thanks for that. And I mean, 
it seems like a lot of work has gone into green finance, uh, uh, you know, being able to do that on the construction side. But in terms of some of the work that we've done at our firm, what we realize is that the construction part is pretty well taken care of through mm -hmm. the project finance. The sort of secondary market once, you know, the projects have been completed, uh, sort of takes over. That's why you're seeing some of that. But there's one piece missing, which is essentially the people who are going to own these homes or these facilities mm -hmm. now. Is there any type of green funding for people who want to actually own these sort of properties? Because the majority of the number of people, and I think when we last looked at the numbers in Ghana, there was something like just over 6,000 uh, 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 mortgages uh, in, in the country of about yeah. 30 million people. Um, and But yet there are, I think, over 10 million homes. So how are people funding their homes? A lot of them are using their you know, mm -hmm. their change and, you know, using 30, 40 years to build a home, you know, a brick at a time. But what other products are you seeing in the market for the retail investor? Oh, well, not only the retail investor, but the, the people who actually want to own these homes long term and be able to pass them down to their to their children, et cetera. And Anel, if you if you have any, uh, yes, I'll, I'll go around on this. I'd one. love to speak to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Eric, our theory of change is that all finance is green finance and people just don't know it yet. And we're seeing that across the spectrum of capital. Um, we've gone from green bonds and green project bonds to banks now seriously thinking and rolling out um, green home loans for people who want to uh, sort of manage the efficiency information around their house. The IFC Edge tool allows people to do that and even has a capability of sort of shared data to your bank. And um, what we're really seeing is this organizing and at a broader level, at a continent level, of a co-financing theme that's filtering down from the development finance institutions into the banks and enabling the banks to offer these propositions right down to um, the, the retail investor. In Ghana specifically, I can speak to APSA Ghana, which is the member of the APSA group. They are beneficiaries of a 470 million um, IFC uh, greening facility uh, that just got a top up now during COVID. And part of that is particularly ring fenced to extend the green financing proposition in Ghana, in Seychelles, in Kenya and Tanzania. So um, I definitely think the, the retail investor is only going to have more and more options. And uh, we see these themes as sort of global sustainability mandates pushed down on how financial institutions uh, capture and, and access finance themselves. Sure. And she, for you, I think this, this, yeah. if no, I take one more bite at the apple, I think this <laughs> sure. all falls into, um, you know, in the, in the context of our business, Ikuku Global, what we do is map uh, not only the physical climate risk, but what we term transitional climate risk. And that's understanding sort of how the laws in the sector are changing to support, uh, to support or disincentivize uh, carbon laden uh, projects. And um, I think a to Ben's point around sort of all of the work that's already gone, the thoughtful work that's happened in Ghana around what's the best uh, sustainable bond framework. Um, at a continent level, the Climate Bonds Initiative, uh, we had the pleasure of working with them to bring to market the Africa Green Bond Framework to begin to set in place a taxonomy for people to adopt. And each of these will be sort of specified in a, a country context. but all around outside of sort of the hard green finance taxonomies that are crystallizing, you see that across industries, um, corporates are recognizing the opportunity. So in Kenya, uh, Kenya was the first actually where the pension funds uh, came together to revisit how they make um, capital available outside of their traditional insurance mandates so that they can invest directly into green infrastructure. And that was a critical part of how the ACON, uh, ACON uh, Green Bond, Kenya's first green bond came to market. And so off of the back of the excitement of sort of pension funds being able to put a little on the table and, and issue a new and exciting oversubscribed project, uh, you see insurers uh, starting to sit up and take notice in other markets and the same begin to happen. In South Africa, on the back of that excitement in 2018, just at the start of this year, South Africa pension laws have been reworked so as to allow pension funds to participate more directly in the infrastructure opportunity and the green transition opportunity. And we're beginning to see this theme, right, of uh, pension funds wanting more direct access uh, to real assets and using uh, the sustainability 
uh, roadmap as a, a way forward to, to do that. So it's wow. the transitional risk uh, opportunity that's really changing across sort of hard finance laws, but also the, the mandates around how we, we pull capital together and, and get it ultimately to uh, developers and the benefits to the retail consumer at the end. Sure. No, okay, thanks. thanks. Thanks for that. And, and, and Sheikh, just on your side, in terms of how are you, how are you managing the, I guess, the end user of the, of the final product? Because a green building is, is great, but if people can't afford to live in them, then really and truly... Uh, there's no point. So how, how are you managing that at HC? Yeah, uh, the, the, but there's two angles to it is to, you know, whether you, you talk about the, the commercial side of it and whether you talk about the residential side of it. And so, you know, what we're starting to see, and that's why we're, it's exciting because we're really at the beginning where everything is being created in front of our eyes is, you know, you're starting to have side pockets inside the banks to uh, finance you know, green developers. Uh, and then the, the next step is to have side pockets that are, you know, sometimes funded by uh, some of the DFIs or certain institutions that will go towards funding mortgages uh, for uh, uh, developments that are, that are green. Um, and then the next step after that is, you know, it's going to be, I think it's, it's going to grow from there and become kind of a, a specific product and a norm. Um, but it's kind of, you know, a bit of our job. So, you know, we're working on something on the residential now where we're trying to make sure we get both sides of the, of the equation. So I think it's going to come from um, the market perspective, pushing some of these things, because you already have certain programs with certain banks that are funding um, parts of developments with part grant, part loan, if what you're doing is green. So if you're doing some solar panels, then, you know, you get part grant, Part, uh, loan on a concessional basis uh, for that, but this is kind of just the, the I think the the beginning, and um, you know it's it's going to come I think you know and I'm a bit biased, but from the developer side, side to to make sure that we we create the opportunities for that to happen and facilitate and dif differentiate um, what we're doing so that you know actual end users say ah well. I should go for that because there's specific financing already in place, et cetera. Um, but it's not going to happen on, on, on its own. Somebody has to kind of steer the pot for it to happen. Sure, thanks. And for Ben and for, for Danny, I have a slightly different question in that although the finance seems to be available, a lot of it seems to have been negotiated bilaterally apart from those who have been able to access the capital mm -hmm. market. Now, how much of that finance, you know, uh, uh, with the DFI should come through the capital market. So for example, if, you know, any of the, the banks in Ghana was going to get access to green finance, I mean, it makes sense to me that you would have banks establish green bond programs under which they are financed because that helps develop the market. And sort of what is your experience mm -hmm. on that? I, I said at AFU and then after that, Ben can take a stab at that for us as well. Sure. I mean, I, th I think at the, at the moment, we're starting to speak to a few banks uh, in, in the sub region trying to, see if we can be part of their, their green bond programs. Um, I would say, um, since we actually started investing a lot in the green uh, sector, we haven't done any bonds, uh, I mean, to, to the capital markets. Uh, we are speaking with, um, I mean, I can't mention names right now. Sure. Because, yeah, yes, yes. It's, it's confidential, but I mean, there is an appetite definitely to, to, to join other institutional investors or retail investors to, to be part of the capital markets for, for green bonds. So for us, that is, a direction that we want to take and, and we're actively uh, engaging in that in that in that respect yeah okay yeah i can actually touch on a little bit on the uh, earlier question one of the, one of the things that we actually have been working on is we've been assisting the uh, national mortgage housing fund um uh, uh here in ghana in terms of coming up with this um strategic plan with an emphasis placed on the possibility of issue um utilizing um, um utilizing green mortgages um, so that is something that's in discussion. And in terms of our in interaction with some of the local banks, we've really been placing an emphasis on them seeing the benefits of offering uh, more green retail products uh, with the idea of fo really focusing on um, uh, green mortgages as a possibility. And in doing so, incentivizing customers to utilize um, solar panels and actually get their pro their homes to a point where they are green, given the cost savings, which are associated with that 
and that potentially providing an opportunity to make it easier to service um, these mortgages. So that's a conversation that we've been having in terms of trying to get these uh, financial institutions to really um, jump on that particular bandwagon. Sure. Look, thank you very much uh, for, for that. Uh, I mean, I think we want to open up for questions now from, uh, from the audience and from people who are at home. Uh, so please fire away with your questions for, for the panel that we have. Um. I see some questions in the chat. I'd like to bring it up to you. Sure. Um, so there's one question that actually was for Access Bank. Yeah, um, one Nelson is trying to find out. I would like to know the coupon rate on the Access Green Bank, sorry, the Access Bank Green Bond. Have they been able to consistently pay this coupon rate? Secondly, do investors receive reports on the performance on the green bonds so far? Uh, how does the risks of the bank affect the performance of the bond? So that's a whole pack that is going to Ampa for Philip if he's still online. He's off. Okay, so then we'll jump that. Um, Yeah, I think that's the main question so far. So maybe I'll just open up to the room. Oh, there's a question. Uh, perhaps. Oh, OK, sorry. Maybe you want to take it for access? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I know. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I didn't want to take it to, to access, but I thought perhaps an, an important aspect of this price conversation um, that we're, we're not bringing to the fore is, um, you know, no, 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 not the price conversation as well. Oh, well, when we think about projects at, in, in the aggregate, um, you know, is looking at the, the benefits that um, green finance bring, brings us, I have two ideas really competing, but I, I wanted to, oh yes, it goes back to building materials and being expensive. Um, the point was around, you know, an, an important aspect of thinking about green is also thinking about how we can use local materials uh, and drop uh, the cost of financing in that way by using sort of indigenous, locally sourced materials, because a huge aspect, even in how the edge calculator works, is uh, sort of quantifying the embodied energy in whatever project that it, it is that you're bringing to market. Um, so just as we think about, uh, yeah, the, the price of bringing green projects to market, it's so intricate and, and not necessarily just the, the ultimate um, yield. That's one, I think the conversation around uh, investor appetite and demand and how you consistently see green bonds oversubscribed through that values alignment uh, definitely drops the cost of searching for finance in the long run as you build these long-term relationships with providers of sustainable capital. Um, Access Bank also critically spoke about the green trade opportunity. And I think that's one that's slightly beyond uh, uh, the, the scope of this conversation. But in terms of allocating capital, it's not just is the trade, you know, the, the, the product the sort of beneficial. There's also a real aspect of the green trade question that has to do with near shoring and shortening our supply chains and making communities more resilient by having domestic lightweight manufacturing uh, uh, facilities, particularly in the food space, uh, which creates a significant opportunities for, for, for project developers there from okay. a green trade supply chain nearshoring perspective. Yeah. There's another question, right? Okay. Right, uh, but just a quick one as well. So we had a bit of technical hitches uh, during the finance session. So do you just have a few more oh, minutes added? So those of you waiting for the next session, which is on the zero sum game, uh, please just give us a few minutes. We'll be wrapping up and then getting into that. So um, sure. sharing the, the, there was a question from somebody who's developing some, some property in Accra and had asked how they access uh, a green finance. I think Sheikh spoke. Uh, about that uh, in, in quite broad terms. So maybe just a quick summary from your side for, for the benefit of the 
of the person asking the question, Sheikh. That would be grateful. Um, sure. Uh, I guess uh, very uh, succinctly, th there's two ways, uh, I think. One is if you decide to go the ACORN way or our way by basically doing a bond, whether it's listed or not listed on your local markets. Typically, the markets have uh, uh, their own green bond framework. So I'm assuming in Ghana, I haven't researched it, but I'm assuming the, the regulator has some type of framework uh, for green bond uh, in place as to you know, how you qualify. Uh, and then you know, if that's the case, then you know, there's all these other things that you might have to do uh, a rating, as I mentioned, uh, getting the certifications um, from uh, the third party that can and kind of bless you. And the underlying is your building needs to be either edge certified or uh, one of the other recognizable uh, uh, certification mechanisms. So you have LEED um, and uh, BREAM. So you have a, a number of them, whether it's in the US or in Europe. So that's one option. And um, option two, uh, you know, you have to check with specific banks. I know in Padivar, there's a specific bank with Societe Generale that has a program. So if you have a green building uh, that's edge certified, uh, then they automatically give you um, this separate window to fund uh, uh, your project at a lower, lower uh, uh, interest rate. And there's also a subpart that uh, you get at... at um, um, as a grant as well, depending on some of the materials that you use, if you want to use solar panels, etc. Uh, so I think depending on the market you're in, you know, you have to check, but I'm pretty sure uh, if you look closely, um, even in Ghana, there's probably at least one or two banks that must have similar uh, uh, programs in place. Sure. No, thanks. So I think that answers uh, uh, Bernard's, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the previous uh, questionnaire's question. But there's another question on here with regards to solar power and funding for that kind of a project. Yeah. Um, would you want to answer that? They're, they're asking how, how they can get access to that funding for, for solar projects. So, no, I think, I think for, for, for solar projects, you, you, you would have to approach us essentially, and then they explain to us how the project is, uh, is being developed. And then also um, what are the dynamics around the projects, um, just, just so we understand better. Uh, but yes, we, we can do financing for, for solar projects. There's, there's no problem with that. Yeah, and I think piggying back off of what you said, I think one other point to highly to emphasize is at what stage of the uh, project life cycle are you at? You're at the early stage, or are you looking for um, your know, expansion capital to uh, um, that? Those are key pieces to really keep in mind. Um, there are quite a number of uh, crowdsourcing platforms that have been coming up, i.e. Franklin Green, et cetera, mm. which are uh, really focused on supporting uh, solar uh, projects in particular. So I think those are something to keep in mind. Sure. And I think there's one question about how we extend mortgages from, uh, from Mr. Echo Spielgaber, I think, how we extend mortgages to many more uh, thousand households. Now, we have a view on this. Um, the more green finance that's available for affordable housing means that ultimately people would be able to get into more homes. Uh, and once that you know initiative kicks off, and I think most of the panelists have spoken about, it's incremental. So we start off with you know getting the programs on the way, getting the frameworks in place, and then the funding coming because uh, six thousand mortgages really doesn't work for you know for for economy that's looking to grow. And hopefully with the green finance, we get to a point where essentially there's more affordable housing because people have implemented things that you know are, are safe for the environment and there's funding available for it and that hopefully fills the, the the gap that we have i think there's just one more question that i saw um with regards to getting the local banks around green financing now look i think from Cowbank being, uh, we're here today at Cowbank, they've been very supportive of the Green Initiative, Access Bank. There have been several other banks locally that have. I think a lot of this comes down to some of these uh, uh, webinars that we're having to sort of inform the public about the availability of this kind of finance. But for sure, if there's any information you require, if you go to the website on the Green uh, uh, Building Summit, you'll find all the information you require there. But there are a lot of banks that are uh, on top of this, and I'm sure you'll be able to access that funding. But uh, I think we've come to the end of this, and I'd just really like to thank all the panelists for your time, for those of you who are spending your time for with us at home. 
Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, and I'd like to thank my co-panelists for, for being here. So thank you all very much for being part of this. Uh, and we'll go on to the next session. Thank you very much.